Hello, I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is the story of the Fall of Watoga. To properly detail its fall, we have to cover the city as it was before it fell. We've covered individual structures and organizations within the city in previous videos, but we haven't really covered the people of the city, aside from a few students and teachers, one named and several nameless mayors, and a few AMS employees. Though it was one man who brought the city down, to know why Watoga fell, you have to know more about the people, as it was because of its citizens that Scott Turner initiated his war against the city. Modern Watoga was built using Rockco technology, with funding provided by Atomic Mining Services to be the city of the future. You can find billboards advertising for the city all the way out in Charleston to the west, where AMS sought potential citizens. Much of the labor in the city was automated away through the use of a centralized system that controlled an army of civil service robots. At the emergency services building, doctors, paramedics, firefighters, and even police were replaced by robots. At the Watoga Civic Center, even basketball players had been replaced by robots. At the municipal center, the only human employee was the mayor. Service jobs like haircutting had been taken by robots. Even basic volunteer efforts such as handing out Halloween candy had been taken by robots. With so many of the jobs taken by robots, you're probably wondering, what did the people do for a living? Some of those who lived in Watoga worked at the AMS headquarters, some at the Ropco Research Center to the north, and some worked at the few remaining service jobs that existed within the city. Of the working people who lived in Watoga, we know most about two couples, the Osmonds and the Mustafas. Taylor and Kelly Osmond lived in Watoga with their son Bobby. Taylor worked at the Robco Research Center, traveling via the monorail every day to work. Prior to her work for Robco, Taylor worked for General Atomics, where she was responsible for major upgrades to the Miss Nanny line of robots, specifically regarding their behavior towards children. Taylor's wife Kelly worked at Slocum's Joe, where she was terribly treated by the entitled people of Watoga. What the belittling snobs she served didn't know was that Kelly was a dentist who had lost her job when she was replaced by robots. Following a chance encounter at a concert, Taylor and her old college friend Riley Mustafa reconnected by email in October of 2076. Following 10 years apart, both of these tech workers had ended up living in Watoga. While Riley worked for AMS, Riley's spouse Jamie was a former radiologist who had to take a job as an interior decorator when their job was taken by robots. Riley and Jamie had a daughter named Willie who was about the same age as Bobby Osmond. The Osmonds and the Mustafas were among the lucky few that managed to gain residency in Watoga, as moving to the city wasn't simply a matter of finding an open domicile and moving in, its residents had to go through an application process as though it was some sort of city-sized country club. According to Robco's HR department, even full-time employees of the Robco Research Center were rejected in their applications for residence. Though Watoga seems to have had the highest per capita wealth of the cities of pre-war Appalachia, it still had classes citizens looking down on those who had less than they had. Claudia, a society lady, felt the need to chastise her daughter Amelia for dating a man she believed it was improper for her to be dating because it would damage her reputation with the other ladies of society. But as Amelia explained to her mother, they didn't just let anybody into Watoga, and the man Claudia thought was a dirty hippie her daughter was dating was in fact a wealthy artist who just so happened to wear patchouli while making art that Amelia sold. When the miners began their anti-automation protests, Watoga was a target thanks to the atomic mining services used of the Hornwright auto miners on their sites. At least one of the residents of the city was furious that the city security wasn't stopping the peaceful, albeit loud, protests outside the city. While the automation efforts undertaken by AMS, Robco, and Hornwright hurt Kelly Osmond, Jamie Mustafa, and many of the miners in the region through underemployment and unemployment, the people of the nearby Bogtown were completely ruined by Watoga's automation. Though the area is called Bogtown, I think that it is likely just a name it acquired as an epithet from the citizens of Watoga, or as a simplification after the war, and that it likely had a different name before the town was ruined. The people of the Bogtown found employment in Watoga before its automation. Once Robco's work was complete, the economy of the Bogtown collapsed. As the structures on Main Street began to collapse, likely due to the subterranean detonations undertaken by atomic mining services, government agents condemned their homes. When one resident asked what she was supposed to do, an agent sneered at her saying, Just buy an apartment up in Watoga. Ain't that supposed to be the city of the future? The attitudes of the Watogans toward the outsiders went a long way towards initiating the destruction of their city. Scott Turner was one of those outsiders despised by Watoga, and one of those full-time Robco employees that failed to get past the application to live in the city. Excluded from Watoga, Mr. Turner ended up living in a trailer parked in a garage on the outskirts of the Bogtown. The rejection he suffered festered within him and coalesced into envious animosity towards the people who lived in the city he longed to live in. While partying on Christmas 2076, Mr. Turner and his associates decided to act against Watoga. The next day, they named the group the Free Watoga People's Party. Despite working as a programmer at Robco, Mr. Turner was seriously anti-automation, viewing the robots as, quote, taking over everything, unquote. The group believed that they would be taken more seriously if they called themselves a party, implying that there were more people involved. Despite the desire to seem numerous, they rejected a new member, another Robco employee, fearing that he couldn't be trusted. As the weeks went on, their major activity appears to have been involved in the composition of a manifesto for the organization, reading as strongly anti-establishment and anti-automation. 
They began to print these manifestos in February 2077, distributing them around the area. At the General Steakhouse near the northern end of the Cranberry Bog, and just across the highway from the Robco Research Center, Mr. Turner was a regular customer. He appears to have felt a certain level of kinship with at least one of the owners, and thus felt safe distributing several copies of the manifesto to them, going so far as to ask that they distribute those copies in their menus and with to-go orders. Though they appear to have stored these manifestos rather than distribute them, they don't seem to have gone to the cops with what, from the outside, definitely would appear to be communistic sympathizing literature. Whether they didn't call the police on Scott Turner because they agreed with him, or because he was a Robco employee, and they were doing all that they could to retain paying customers, especially from Robco, we'll probably never know. As Mr. Turner worked his ideology into action, he began to tinker with the programming of the robots of Watoga. His plan was to use the robotic servants of Watoga against their masters. He would force the orderly and peaceful evacuation of the city with the robots once they were under his control. As part of extending his reach into their systems, he caused the food preparation robots to ruin about a day's worth of food by pepper bombing it. When he attempted to use this example to sway the mayor, he was foiled by the randomization of mayor selection and the randomization of the term length, when the mayor he was attempting to communicate with was abruptly replaced by a new mayor, Thomas H. Molly. He contacted the new mayor to meet, but there's no record that Mayor Molly ever took this threat seriously. During this time, Mr. Turner began to work on a side project at his job, writing a program to use a camera to scan faces. What management didn't know was his plans for this software. Mr. Turner wrote a letter to his mother explaining about his success with the pepper bombing and about his plan to use the emergency service robots to start a revolution. Along with his hope to live in the city, he wanted to make sure his mother was there too, telling her to come to Otogo once it was done. As he finished his facial scanning software, the final parts of his preparation for his plan were complete. He would broadcast an update to the operating protocol of the robots in Watoga, and break the update system such that only his terminal could be used to make these updates. He would then lock his office such that only he could access it. He would then use the emergency service robots to force the elitists that had rejected him out of their homes. His own likeness part of the city's whitelist, he would then try to the city, offer them the option to beg for their homes, and fill out a new resident fitness application of his own device, rejecting them all. Everything was set for Operation Free Watoga. On Friday, October 22nd, 2077, just one day before the bombs, Scott Turner broadcast an update to Watoga. Something he did with this patch went horribly wrong. The patch pulsed out across Watoga in stages, as can be read in the conversation between Kelly Osmond and the Osmond's Miss Nanny that was supposed to be watching their son Bobby. Bobby was over at a friend's house. When he didn't return at the proper time, the Osmond's Miss Nanny attempted to contact the other Miss Nanny to no avail. It then tried to contact emergency services, again without success. When the Osmonds Miss Nanny began to search for little Bobby, the patch hit, and it turned hostile and ownerless. This status was that of all the robots in Watoga, suddenly viewing every human in the city as an enemy. After having relied on these robots for basically every task, the people of Watoga were completely unprepared for this onslaught. Enormous numbers of the citizenry were destroyed in moments. The emergency service robots dispatched to help people were responsible for a large part of the slaughter. Barbara Elizabeth, the new mayor to replace Thomas H. Molly, had to fend off paramedic robots that left her wounded. In the bog town, Scott Turner collapsed as the crisis unfolded, suffering from ringing in the ears, migraine headaches, and ascending paralysis. At the Robco Research Center, his co-workers couldn't fix his mistake because they were locked out of the update system, and they couldn't access his computer because they were locked out of his office as well. That night, some of the people in Watoga managed to get out, a few of those guided out by Mayor Elizabeth herself. From the bog, they watched as the army attempted to retake the city without success. The next morning, the bombs came down. At a time when people needed a city like Watoga the most, they were completely incapable of accessing it. Homeless refugees from Watoga fled west and north to seek shelter as background radiation levels soared. In his trailer, Scott Turner did all that he could to rectify his mistake, recording the process by which people could add themselves to the city's whitelist. Though he couldn't fix his mistake, he tried to minimize it as best he could in his final moments. He wrote a letter of apology to an old friend and died on the floor of his trailer, where he can still be found today. To those not on the city's whitelist, the robots of Watoga are just as dangerous as they were on October 22nd, 2077. The story of Scott Turner and the city of Watoga is one of jealousy and envy. The people of the city didn't want to share their home with people like Scott Turner, jealously guarding it with an exclusionary application. In his envy of the Watogans, Scott Turner attempted to steal their homes for himself and his chosen. Though he cloaked his desires in the language of the rights of the people, it was envy that was his driving force. Though he regretted his actions with his dying breaths, the blame for what happened with Toga lies heavily on Scott Turner. He was one of Robco's most talented programmers, and he should have known the potential consequences for his actions. And in truth, there's reason to think that he did have an inkling that this would happen. When expressing his thanks to the owners of the General Steakhouse, Mr. Turner requested a picture of the two, saying, quote, I need a picture of each of you to scan into my program so you'll be able to get into Watoga without getting killed, unquote. 
This could have just been hyperbole, but it says to me that at the very least this thought popped into his head and that he went ahead with his plans anyway. I think that's going to do it for the story of the fall of Watoga. This has been the Original Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.